Welcome to Truth Radio. This is Kent Hoven and my son Eric. Hey, how you guys doing out there today? Doing great. I am anyway. How you doing? I'm doing I've pretty seen good. Seen you in a while, son. I yeah. just flew in from Welcome somewhere. Back. Where was I? Orlando. Anyway, we're glad you joined us. We believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. We think the evolution theory is one of the dumbest and most dangerous ideas in the history of the world. And I taught science for 15 years and began creation science evangelism about 15 years ago. Now I've been traveling full-time as an evangelist, and Eric's been traveling for four and a half years. Four and a half years now. Yeah. Four and a half years speaking on creation. Let's read a few testimonies that have been sent to us, and then we're going to finish with some of the anti hovend websites that are uh, quite a few out there, ne nearly a thousand. Testimony from Mark Roman. Just a letter thanking you for the great information your ministry provides. I am a naval medical officer currently de uh, deployed in Africa for six months. I will return to my... Um, home and base in Jacksonville, Florida sometime in March. I too have the desire to teach creation science as a ministry. I have been studying and researching for the past three years now. Hopefully I can start soon. I retire from the Navy in 18 months. I was teaching creation in a home Bible study group and was uh, I was leading before I was deployed to Africa. I attended Vineyard Christian Fellowship of Jacksonville. I have your entire teaching and debate series in DVD here with me in Africa and I studied them daily. Thank God for laptops, Amen. along with other great creation science ministry resources on the seminar, or on the internet. I look forward to seeing you on April 18th, on April 18th, I believe, in Jacksonville, Florida, at Trinity Church. Keep up the good work. God bless your ministry there and everyone working there. Well, amen. These videotapes go everywhere. I got a call at 3 in the morning one time. Phone rang. I sat up, said, hello. They said, hey, I'm watching your videotape. This is great. I said, where are you? They said, I'm in Saudi Arabia. I said, the world's round, you know. It's dark on my side. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, there's a time change, isn't there? I said, yeah, a couple hours from Saudi Arabia to Pensacola, Florida. No, I know. Anyway, I'm glad you enjoyed that, Mark. Appreciate that. Spread it around. If you want to come visit our ministry this September, September 17, 18, 19, we're going to have a Southeast Creation Conference. And anybody's welcome to come, 50 bucks, and you get... For that, you get into all the sessions. You get an audio tape of every single session and a nice little binder we're going to give out to everybody who comes of all 18 sessions, even those that you can't get to because there'll be three going at the same time. We'll tape them all. That'll be in the binder. You can get that, plus all kinds of goodies and stuff, plus a tour of Dinosaur Adventure Land. Oh, that's worth $50 right that's there. That's worth 50 bucks right there. Wow. we got one of the tour guides, Dan, in the studio right now with us. Dan, it's worth the tour, isn't it? 50 bucks just to, just to have Dan give you show, yes, show you around this place. You don't get the fifty dollars. Uh, fifty dollars goes to a good cause. <laughs> I will tell you about that later. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we are looking for debate opponents for our radio show. Uh, if you want to get somebody who believes in evolution willing to call in, they can call in and be on the program. Our number is eight seven seven four seven nine Dino eight seven seven four seven nine three four six six. If you're in the U.S., otherwise, call eight five zero four seven nine Dino. Same thing eight five zero four seven nine three four six six. And we'll be glad to take questions or comments. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we tape programs and have to re-air them. So if we're not live, there should still be a secretary alive, we'd hope, uh, well, <laughs> by that time. Yeah. At least somebody would be alive. Okay. Uh, one more testimony, and then uh, we'll get into some uh, anti hoven websites here. Testimony by Tim Watts here, writing in. He says, I just wanted to say thank you for your ministry. Your scientific knowledge is outstanding. By the way, Dad, yep, you're, you're pretty smart. Okay. Hmm. Uh, my dad has been making a lot of tapes, and people are now seeing the light. The light of the world, that is. The church I attend, First Baptist Orange City, Florida, has a targeted discipleship ministry going on, and I'm trying to get your videos shown. Because too many Christians believe that God created us through evolution, called theistic evolution. Right. And that's wrong. It discredits all we believe. I want to thank you, and I'll keep praying for you and everyone involved in this ministry. With love, Tim Watts. Amen. And that's by the, the way, truth. the videos have never been copyrighted. That's right. Uh, it's probably cost us a fortune over the years, but hey, we're trying to win the war, not... Not build a mansion. That's not exactly build a castle. Right. right. All right. Okay. There is well, a war going on. You don't ration bullets in wartime. That's, that's right. Do something say. with it. We've said that for years. Not that's happy. been our policy for a long time. Okay, what we've done for the last several broadcasts, we're going to finish up. We've been dealing with different anti hovend websites. <clears throat> I don't feel I have any need to justify what I teach. I mean, you know, we try to teach the truth. We try to stay right down the line. We try to uh, maintain creationist integrity and Christian integrity as much as possible. Uh, we want to know the truth and teach the truth. We believe the evolution theory is absolutely dangerous. It's stupid to begin with, but it's really dangerous, okay? There's no scientific evidence to back it up. So we've offered for a long time a quarter million dollars for anybody with any real scientific evidence for evolution. Started off 15 years ago as a letter to the editor and I offered $1,000 if anybody could prove evolution. A lawyer friend called me and said, hey, let's make it 10000 I said, okay. So I wrote another letter and said, let's make it $10,000. 
Then a friend of mine from uh, out west called me and said, hey, let's make it a quarter million. I said, quarter million? I said, you got to have the money, you know, really have it. He said, no problem. <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. Okay. <laughs> That's the pocket change. So uh, he said, okay. So I said, man, we're great. So then after we ran a bunch of advertising, you know, and said, quarter million dollar proof revolution, he called me and said, hey, let's make it a million. I said, we can make it a hundred million. It wouldn't matter. There is no proof revolution. And I've already got all this stuff I printed up saying a quarter million. So we'll keep it at a quarter million. But just for you listeners, if you, got, if you can prove evolution, we'll, give you, we'll go ahead and give you the million. Uh, four yeah. times normal, just tonight. Just tonight, tonight special. Tonight special. One million dollars. <laughs> you can prove evolution. <clears throat> so what's happened because of that? We've I've had over about a thousand people now have uh, developed websites just anti hoven They don't like what I teach. They don't like something about me. I don't know. I'm the nicest guy I've ever met. But uh, yeah, um, they we went through Carl Mary Church's uh, website, which was geocities.com slash Kent Hoven, because when you type in on Google search. <laughs> thing that comes up is mine, and the second thing that comes up is Carl Mary Church's. That's the only reason we went through his. He has a lot of stuff on his site. We hit some of the highlights in the last few programs, and if anything in there bothers you, any specifics bother you, call us, email us. We'll be glad to take those specifics, but generally, most people that have seen my whole seminar can answer all those questions. Yeah. It's silly stuff, okay? We're going to go to another one here now. This one is, uh, I don't see, see a name on here. It just says me. I thought I saw a name earlier. I emailed somebody back and forth a long time ago. Um, now, no name. just says me. The it's website address, address is geocities.com slash Cape Cavern. Cape Canaveral. Cape Canaveral, sorry, slash hangar slash 2437 slash Hovind. Once again, geocities.com slash Cape Canaveral slash hangar, H-A-N-G-E-R slash 2437 slash Hovind. If you just type in on GeoCities uh, web search, Hovind, it'll be the third one that comes up. So we're just going to go down the line and take a few of the key ones here. His whole argument, I can summarize it for you here in a few words, is that he had an email discussion with me. Where he's wanting, and this is what happen, always happens with the offer. Instead of sending evidence for evolution, they send a bunch of questions picking on details. You know, what bank is the money in? You know, what's the account number? Uh, yeah. How will I be paid? Cashier's check, etc. <laughs> I say, look, send the evidence. They never do. Okay, uh, They just uh, gripe about the offer. The offer is legitimate, the money is there, believe me, and uh, it's perfectly fine. You just send the evidence. Where's the beef? That's what we want to know. Quit talking about it. Show me, uh, show me the beef. So, uh, basically, what he's wanting to know is what is a kind? Because I said in my offer that if you can, uh, one of the many things you'd have to prove to prove evolution would be how fundamentally different kinds of animals can be created from one kind of animal. And so, he's, his gripe, the whole thing here is about, you know, where, what's a kind? All right, well, whoever you are, you're calling yourself me here, M-E. Um, I'm going to uh, try to answer this one more time. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, 10 different times. I've got it open in front of me here. Genesis 1, 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth the grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed was in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Genesis 1, 2. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself, after his kind, and God saw that it was good. There are ten references, I believe, in Genesis chapter 1, where it says they bring forth after their kind. So it's very simple. If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. A horse and a zebra can mate and bring forth offspring. Horse and a zebra are the same kind of animal. A horse and a pine tree cannot. No. A horse and a turtle cannot. A horse and a hamster cannot. A horse and a whale cannot. A horse and a dog cannot. So, I don't have to go through all of them, but I think generally a five-year-old would tell you what are the same kind. I mean, if you put all the animals in the world in a, in a big line, a five-year-old could go with you and pick out 99% of those that are the same kind and get it pretty close. If they're able to bring forth, they're the same kind. That's the Bible definition. So, some of the, some of the border fringe ones might be a little tough to actually figure, you know. Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits can no longer interbreed. However, they can both breed with Minnesota rabbits. So, they're still obviously the same kind. I think what's happened in the last 6,000 years, the kinds of animals have diversified to where you get some pretty bizarre varieties that may no longer be able to reproduce. So, my definition of kind is, if they originally were able to reproduce, they're the same kind. Yeah, that would make sense. Today, if they may, not, may no longer be able to reproduce because of, you know, whatever uh, variations that have happened, uh, they're still the same kind. Now, Chihuahuas and Great Danes can still bring forth. They have a few mechanical problems, yeah, but they can, still, they can still bring forth. Actually, they can. 
And so they're the same kind. A dog and a wolf and a coyote are the same kind of animal. And so that's the Bible definition. So this entire website asking for what is a kind, first place, you're missing the whole point, okay? You're picking out a detail in the offer, you're missing the whole point, and you're trying to throw up a uh, red herring. What they do when they, uh, uh, they would drag a red fig across the trail to throw the coots off the trail or something. So a red herring is when you try to get somebody off track and say, oh, wow, look at this over here, you know, so they miss the main point. Yeah. He's saying, Hovind never defined a kind, as if that proves you got proof for evolution. <laughs> You're exactly. missing the point. You never sent any evidence for evolution. I would like to know, where's the beef? What evidence do you send it? Quit griping. Uh, I, my recommendation would be actually you take the site down, because it really, I think, reflects badly on you. Some people may look at it and say that it helps uh, people to be able to try to... Uh, Look at both sides of the argument, though, at the same time. Well, sure. I mean, anybody put up any websites they want, and uh, that's fine. But you know, it makes some people look kind of dumb when they say things that ought to be obvious, I think, to a kindergartner. You know. Um, okay, here's website number four that comes up. This one is talkorigins.org. Now, Jonathan, Talk Origins has all kinds of uh, evolution-based stuff. Is that correct? They claim to be a news group. They, they claim to be a news group. They hate Christians, they hate Christians and, hate cre and they hate me on talkorigins.org uh, slash FAQ slash Hovind. So here we go. Uh, Kent Hovind, who calls himself Dr. Dino, is a charismatic proponent of the young earth creationism who enjoys enormous popularity with audiences and web forums participants from around the United States. Well, thank you. They said something nice. Pretty nice. We're not That's very true. far into it, though. <laughs> it's okay. He runs Creation Science Evangelism, and thank you for the link. By the way, nearly all of these guys link to us, which is good. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that guy. Yeah. Like the, you know, people were saying about the disciples were saying, well, there's people out there preaching Jesus Christ, and they, you know, they, they're not with us. He said, hey, Christ has preached, you know, whether of envy or contention. So I think the truth gets out. Yeah. So I think, believe it or not, some of these anti hoven sites are doing more good for the creation cause and the cause of Christ than they realize. Certainly really than they want to. <laughs> Certainly more so, good than they want. Simply looking at their arguments, it does not take a rocket scientist to figure out uh, what's going on here and the truth, you know. So, yeah, you're right. Well, I'm going to go through these, and if you spot any particular ones you think we ought to hit, let me know here. Um, he's got a whole bunch of links here to all the other Antihoven websites. Of course, they all do that. They link to each other. Um, here's, um, oh, he's got a link to arguments we think creation should not use. We addressed that on the last program. I think uh, the... I made my stand once. I don't think it's worth uh, fighting with another Christian brother over this. And I think it's uh, basically straining at gnats and swallowing camels in some cases here. Um, okay, second paragraph. How good are the young earth arguments? He goes through and lists some of the young earth arguments. You wanted to go through some of these, right, Eric? Uh, well, just to, go, just to show them. I mean, he goes through every single one that you offer. When you click on that link, uh, talks about it only takes one proof, the shrinking sun, accumulation of cosmic okay, dust. Okay, well, let's just go one at a time. Period comments. Is it true that it only takes one proof to show that the Earth is not billions of years old? He uh, says in his article there, he says, no, this is the, uh, the erroneous detail that, you know, your, your silver bullet is going gonna, is gonna to do the damage and do everybody in. Well, in a court of law, this, this it links to another website, which I just went to, talkorigins.org, Hoven, How Good Are the Young Earth Arguments, uh, by Dave Madsen. And he says um, that it's not correct that only one proof of a young earth would prove it. Now, Dave, in a court of law, I was just in court today. You were in court today. Over Some kids stole our moped, and we had to go down there and testify. And all. You had to go down there. Anyway, <clears throat> um, got the moped back, by the way. <clears throat> and we're going to try to win the kid to the Lord. We're not his enemy. Yes. He's, he's going to be in trouble for a lot of things for a long time. But <laughs> yeah. once he gets out of jail, we'll, we're going to try to win him to the Lord. Try to help him out. By the way, we donate videotapes to prisons. If a chaplain writes us a letter, we donate a set of tapes. And yes, if you'd like one, feel free to write in. We'd, we'd love to get them to you. They, they've made a big difference in prisons around the world. Oh, thousands get, uh, of prisoners have accepted Christ because of those things. We get emails, letters. Uh, have you told the story to the, to the listening audience of, the, uh, of Hibby? Or do you have no, I have that real quick? Sure. Uh, well, I get so many calls. One guy said uh, uh, he was in prison, and we donated a set of tapes to the prison in... Uh, Pennsylvania, and this guy loved the tapes, got saved. He said, this is great. He went to Hippie and said, you got to watch these videotapes. Hippie's the guy that everybody was afraid of in the prison. <laughs> and uh, he said, I don't want to watch no videotapes. He said, come on, Hippie. He said, all right, what's it about? What's it about? He said, it's about dinosaurs. He said, I sure ain't going to watch no tapes about dinosaurs. <laughs> you know? So he finally, you know, 
sweetly talked him into watching one. He said, all right, I'm going to watch 10 minutes. And if I don't like it, I'm getting up and leaving. He said, okay. Hippie sat down and watched five hours of the video series and got saved. And uh, then he said, you know, everybody in prison ought to see these things. And if Hippie says everybody needs to see it. So for the next, uh, I forget how long, everybody was watching today. They had over 20 former drug dealers saved in the prison while Amen. watching the video series. Dealing just, for Jesus now, Amen. Baby. <laughs> They've had some great results. So uh, several people donate to our ministry to help us be able to do that, to give out videotapes to prisons. And if you can get involved, either send us chaplain's names or have the chaplain send us a letter or send us some money so we can donate it to prison. We'll be glad to do that. Uh, we want to get the gospel out. I figure I'll be there someday anyway, so might yeah. as well. <laughs> anyway, so Matson is saying it's not just one uh, young earth proof, and I'm saying, Dave, you're wrong, okay? If a guy is in court and accused of a crime, and he's got one foolproof alibi, he's innocent. If they've got all kinds of evidence that he's guilty, but he can prove he was, you know, 80 miles away, I'm sorry, he's out. He's, he's, off, he's off the hook. So, the burden of proof is on the evolutionists, not the creationists, to prove their point. <clears throat> the evolutionists would like us to pay for their religion to be taught in the school system. Well, then it's up to you to prove your religion is correct. If you believe you came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago, prove it. Person, if you yeah. can't prove it, then quit teaching it like part of science. They'll say, well, we haven't got all the evidence in yet. Okay, well, until you do, take it out of the books. Until you can prove it, it's got no business deserving the status of science. Okay, it's not a science. It's a religion. I think a dumb one at that. But hey, it's okay to have a dumb religion. If you want to believe Grandpa flung from his tail, that's fine. You go ahead and believe that. So he's wrong. Dave's wrong. It does only take one proof of a young earth, number one. Secondly, I think there are many more than one proof than one uh, proof of a young earth. I think there's lots of evidences. Okay, the shrinking sun is his argument. He goes through this big, long diatribe about the shrinking sun, goes through all this stuff about the sun going through cycles and things like that. Well, let me just summarize this and say... Um, the sun is burning. The sun is burning an enormous amount of fuel. It's losing 5 million tons a second. Now, what has happened, some creationists have taken this argument, I think, to a, to a false extreme. They've said, well, the, the observed measured rate of the sun shrinking was about 5 feet an hour over a 100-year span. Um, and so they said, okay, if you extrapolate 5 feet an hour back in time, and then they pick a number, and they'll say, you know, X number of million years ago, the sun was touching the earth. As soon as you pick any number, it doesn't matter. Right away, the evolutionists jump on the number and miss yes. the whole point. Mm -hmm. They purposely, I think, miss the entire point. The sun is shrinking. It's burning. It's Bottom using line is, it is doing that. It is doing that. There's no argument. And if they want to say, well, it used to be, you know, it, it's gaining fuel from somewhere. I'd like to have a mechanism for how it can do that. I mean, the sun is losing energy. It's losing mass. It's losing, it's burning up its fuel supply. Okay. He gives an example in, in the article about the tides. You know, we could observe the tides going out and conclude that he's saying that's what we're doing with the shrinking sun. Right. We're seeing the tide go out and extrapolating just that six hours back and saying, you know, a few weeks ago there was no water here on Earth. Yeah, and using the tide as an example compared to the sun is, 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 is stupid, Dave. You ought to take this one out of your website, okay? Everybody knows the tide goes up and down. We don't have any way of adding to the sun. We know the tide's going to come back in because it's caused by the moon turning, the Earth turning under the moon. Uh, so it's not correct to say this. This is a false analogy here. And what you've done, what a lot of students did when I taught school, you've given a long answer to make it look like you said something. Okay, I taught school, and always some kid, you know, the, le the less they know, the more they talk about it, you know. And that's the case here with this one. Um, got about a minute and ten seconds left here. Um, tell the break. Okay, so the sun is burning. Now, in the, he says, hope and proof number one is that it limits the sun-earth relationship to less than five million years. Now, Dave, that may be something that I said years ago because I got that from some other site. I have stopped saying that probably, I don't know, many, many years ago, okay? What I say is it can't be billions of years old. This is an example of where if somebody says, you know, five million years ago the sun would have been big enough it would cook the earth, which may be true, I don't know. But either way, uh, they're going to pick on the number and miss the concept. Yeah. They don't get it. The sun's burning, it's losing fuel. As it loses mass, the sun loses its gravitational pull on the earth. So... You can't say the Earth Moon, or the Sun Moon, Sun Earth system has been going for billions of years. Walt Brown has a great article on his website about that, uh, creationscience.com. About he says 1.2 billion years is the max. No, that was for the Moon. That was for the Moon. Either way, if you pick a number, they're going to strain at that. Okay. but you can't do that. You got it. Can't be 4.6 billion years old. You can't have the Sun burning up its fuel and have Venus and Mars, or Venus and Mercury, in between us and the Sun, and say it's been going on for a long time. All right. We'll after come the break, back to a couple more uh, proofs here in just a second. Right after the break. Stay with us, folks. Go to drdino.com. Okay. Starting second segment in three, 
two. Welcome back to the Creation Science Hour. Eric's running a couple of errands for us here, but uh, if you'd like to tune in and be on the program, tell your friends to call in. They can call in and join us live, or they can AOL Instant Message us. Just go to Dr. Dino Live, and you can AOL Instant Message us, or go to our website, drdino.com, and then from drdino.com, you go to the Creation Science Hour link, and then to the AOL Instant Message. Or you can email us questions. We've got a whole pile of email questions. If we get time, we'll get to those. We're trying to get through some of the anti-Hovind websites. We're on Dave Madsen's uh, How Good Are the Young Earth Arguments of Kent Hovind. He claims that all the arguments that I use to show the solar system is young uh, are not any good. So, Dave, here's my answer, and I'll be glad to debate you any time publicly in front of any university. If you'd like to do that, I come to California quite a bit where you're stationed out there. Is Dave Madsen, does he head up the some kind of atheist talk group or something? Or He's... Uh, he heads up Talk Origins? He's one of the larger contributors. Larger contributors to Talk Origins. Okay. Okay. He says that the sun's shrinking. That I, I mentioned <clears throat> that the sun is shrinking. By the way, I haven't used that argument for years, but he's got it on his website. But the sun is shrinking, by the way. But uh, <clears throat> the sun is burning an enormous amount of fuel, and it's losing 5 million tons a second. That is pretty well known. The argument for 5 feet per hour is extrapolated after 100 years of observations. And one of his arguments in here about the 5 feet per hour he says this was based on Halley's uh, solar eclipse back in the 1700s, and he says it may indicate that it's not actually shrinking. Well, Dave, you have to allow, you have to understand the sun, uh, and the earth goes around the sun in an oval shape, and sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's farther away, called uh, perihelion and aphelion. So the, you, to measure one eclipse, you'd have to know what time of the year this was and whether the sun was at perigee or apogee or halfway in between. But I don't think, I think you'd have to look at a longer 100-year span than just one solar eclipse and compare that. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, uh, we don't know yet if the sun is burning by nuclear fusion or by gravitational collapse. If it's nuclear fusion, then there's a neutrino problem. Your answer in your website here is that the sun is burning by nuclear fusion, and that proves that you know it can possibly be billions of years old. Even if it was burning by nuclear fusion, that still doesn't prove it's billions of years old, number one. And <clears throat> number two, you have a real serious neutrino problem, which I think many folks have done studies on that. And it's a, it's a real mystery. Where are the missing neutrinos? Okay, I'm on, Eric, uh, second. Young Earth proof <clears throat> number two. Okay. Hey, also <clears throat> about, the, uh, about the shrinking mo uh, soon. Sun. Soon. Mud. Sun. 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 Moon and sun. There we go. About the shrinking sun. We do mention that on our videotape number seven currently. Right. And we, we explain the two different arguments and everything, though, at the same right. time. That's true. It's no longer as part of the part one proofs of a young Earth. But right. I think it still is a legitimate argument that, and by the way, keep look at this from a bigger picture. Proving the Earth is billions of years old is only the first obstacle oh, yeah. the evolutionist has to overcome. <clears throat> He's got a long ways to go. I don't think they can pass the first hurdle. But <clears throat> if they think the Earth is billions of years old, that still has no, it doesn't help their theory at all. It doesn't prove that life evolved from non-life. It doesn't right. prove any of the other any of the six types of evolution for sure. Right. That's just the first obstacle. Yeah. They have to have billions of years to hide their fairy tale in. You know, exactly. long ago and far away. That's how you hide any fairy tale. Okay. The second one is the moon dust accumulates. And it said the deep, uh, I, I mentioned in my seminar, the moon dust would be much deeper if the moon were billions of years old. And that is exactly correct. Uh, this is one that I do not use in my seminar, have not for years, other than uh, bringing it up if it comes up in Q&A. I have it, uh, I give some historical quotes. For instance, in 1955, <clears throat> Then the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society of London, volume 115, page 585 through 604, Littleton, the famous astronomer, said, uh, I'm sorry, Littleton felt the X-rays and UV light striking exposed moon rocks, quote, could during the age of the moon be sufficient to form a layer over it several miles deep. And that's so, found in more than just this one book. In oh yeah. many places, their quote of it saying, there is going to be a lot of dust on the moon. Well, in 1959, Isaac Asimov said, I quote, I get a picture, therefore, of the first spaceship picking out a nice level place for landing purposes, coming in slowly downward tail first and sinking majestically out of sight. So in 1959, they thought it would be a problem to land on the moon. Now, Madsen says on his uh, uh, website that uh, the ranger uh, and surveyor programs uh, basically determined there was not a dust problem. Okay, I agree. I agree there was no dust problem. But how does that reflect on our argument that says this proves the moon is not billions of years old? Exactly. He's, 
you're stating my point, I think, Dave. Yeah. You need to look that over again. Look, there isn't any dust there. See? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what we're saying there, buddy. There's, he quotes, gives a couple of quotes here. One from a, a lunar surface uh, uh, conference held in April, in late, uh, late in 63, on the lunar surface layer. McCracken and Dublin state, the lunar surface layer, thus formed, would, therefore, consist of a mixture of lunar material and interplanetary material, primarily from, of cometary origin. From 10 centimeters to 1 meter thick, the low value for the accretion rate for the small particles is not adequate to produce large-scale dust erosion or to form deep layers of dust on the moon. For the flux has probably remained fairly consistent during the past several billion years. Okay, well, these guys can certainly think it probably could have remained consistent for billions of years if they want, but that's just guesswork, okay? This was 1963, again, before they went to the moon. Now, you need, I need to understand. If the moon, <clears throat> the moon dust problem, I think is still a valid argument, though I think creationists should use that with some caution. Um, it's not a proof. It's just a good argument. Um, it's logical to assume that space dust would gradually be vacuumed up by all the planets going around. The sun is going to pull in, or the planets are going to pull in the larger, larger particles of dust by their gravitational pull. Right. And the smaller ones are going to be driven out by the Pointing-Robertson effect mentioned in uh, Walt Brown's book, uh, Creation Science, or in the beginning, uh, by Walt Brown, which we sell on our website, or you can go to his, his website, creationscience.com, and get yeah. it. Do you know off the top of your head what that effect is? What, why, why would those well, be? Well, the Pointing-Robertson effect is the solar wind, uh, oh, okay. just, just yeah. the light pressure. You've seen those little glass balls with the little veins in there. One side's black, one's white, and you just shine a light on it and it starts spinning. Right. The light itself has a pressure. And that's going to drive the real tiny particles out away from the sun. The bigger particles would be attracted. Right. To They're too small to be, have a gravitational pull, actually. But, um, so the, the point is, over as time progresses, there's less dust. So if they go up there in the 60s or 50s or 60s and measure the dust, or if they even measure it on Earth, dust accumulation, all of the measurements are taken in the last 50 years it would be expected that there would be less dust then than there was 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. So the accumulation rate that we're observing today is still enough to make it a problem. Um, Walt Brown has a good section on his, let's see, he talked to, um, let's see, I got the article right here. Um, Walt Brown says, in 1981, I had a conversation with Dr. Herbert Zook, Z-O-O-K, of the United States National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. He had been intimately involved in estimating the thickness of the dust layer on the moon before the first Apollo moon landing. He also helped analyze the lunar material brought back from the moon. Of the many interesting things he told me and sent me by mail, one is critical in answering the above question, talking about the dust moon, uh, moon dust thickness. NASA did not realize until the moon dust and rocks were analyzed that only one part in 67, or one and a half percent, of the debris on the moon came from outer space. The rest was pulverized moon rock. And he goes on and explains it here. Basically, if a piece of uh, rock comes in and hits the moon, there's no atmosphere to slow it down. It's going to hit the moon like a bullet <coughs> and blow up a cloud of dust. It's going to resettle. So one and a half percent of the debris on the moon is actually space dust. The rest is regurgitated or pulverized lunar material. So this compounds the problem for the evolutionist. They now have to really scramble to say, why was there only, you know, half of an inch of dust on the moon? Um, Walt Brown goes on and explains the whole thing in great detail here, but basically, using the numbers, since 1 67th of the dust actually comes from space, the actual measured amount of dust turned out to be 2.7 inches per million years. This was based on the chart here from Walt Brown's book about the published data of certain particle sizes, plus the inferred data from smaller sizes. Obviously, the moon has been hit by some really large things. Yeah. It's got some pretty big craters up there. Okay. <laughs> it's been hit by some big stuff, which if during the testing time they leave some plates up there and see how much it gets hit, or they leave satellites in space and see how many micrometeoroid strikes they take, you look at the testing time and say, okay, during the five years it was there, it got X number of thousand little bumps on it. How much would that do over, you know, a million years or a billion years? Walt Brown says in his book here, uh, and I don't, have, I don't have the page number for the seventh edition. What I have a sixth edition here is page 214. It may probably be a different page number now. But he said it's 2.7 inches per million years. That is 1,000 feet of dust in 4.6 billion. So, Dave, I'm sorry, but I think I'll have to stick with my guns. I think that the uh, lunar dust is still a problem for the evolutionist. If you factor in the one part out of 67 is coming from space, the rest is regurgitated lunar soil, 
There was only a half inch of dust there, not much. And it's, yeah, thank you, sir. It's logical to assume, I'm check lunar dust there, uh, son, let's see what page is on now. It's logical to assume that there would be less dust in the last 50 years than there was in the last 1,000 years because it's gradually getting either vacuumed in, you know, hitting, getting hit by planets going around, or being blown out by the pointing Robertson effect. So we probably have a cleaner universe than they did uh, even a few thousand years ago. So the dust accumulation in the past would have been greater than it is in the last 50 years. But even measuring the last 50 years still creates a problem for those who want us to believe the moon is 4.6 billion years old. Okay. Uh, page yeah. 308 is the... Uh, 308 is a new page number. 307 has that chart on it. How much dust and meteorite debris should the moon have if it's 4.6 million years old? Okay. And has lots of information there. Boy, this is just... He goes into all the mathematical equations and everything. Uh, Particle size. Yeah. All yeah. Of that is on his website. And it's all on his website, creationscience.com. You can yeah. go look at that. Another uh, website that you might want to check out is trueorigins.org. Trueorigins.org. It uh, is... Really good, evidently here, I'm checking it out. It, it gives an honest uh, intellectual answer to all the claims made by evolutionists and uh, many of the claims that we're talking about this website, Talk Origins. So they made a website, trueorigins.org, answering many of their questions uh, okay. that they have. Another great one there. Sure. All right, so uh, his third one, short period comets. Uh, check Brown's book on that. He's got a whole section on short period comets. I say in my seminar, short period comets indicate the... Uh, moon is not, or the, the universe is not billions of years old, which is still a legitimate argument. The fact of the matter is comets are constantly being burned up. As they travel through space, they're burning up. You can't just keep losing, pretty soon it's gone, is what I say in my seminar. So, again, Littleton said, in the Mysteries of the Solar System, Oxford, England, uh, Clarendon Press, 1968, page 110, that short period comets have a life expectancy of less than 10,000 years. So the question is obviously, why do we still have comets? They should all be gone. Madsen basically says in his uh, website that the reason we still have comets is because new ones are coming in from the Oort cloud. Well, there is absolutely no proof of the Oort cloud. Uh, if you want to believe there's an Oort cloud, that's fine. Here is a quote recently by um, well, you're looking for that. Carl, Pagan, oh, Carl, Carl Sagan. Sagan. Pagan. Carl Sagan Pagan. and Anne Drew. D R U Y A N, Druyan, on page on a book called Comet, uh, 1997, page, page, two one, ten. page 148, 210. Oh, I have two page numbers. I don't have which one of those. We'll look it up. He says, and I quote: Many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution. Yet there is not a shred of direct observational evidence for its existence. And there really isn't. They no. they put the Oort cloud at a distance of 50,000 astronomical units. Right. How far away is that? Well, distance from the sun to the Earth is one astronomical unit, 93 million miles. Right. Now, to Pluto, Pluto it's 39, right? 39.44 average. Okay. Okay. It's, it's just about, it's impossible to see Pluto without a really good telescope. Okay. <sighs> you certainly aren't going to see an Oort cloud 50,000 astronomical units away. So if you want to believe there's an Oort cloud out there, you just go ahead and believe anything you want. Okay? You're never going to see it, though. <laughs> but it's no longer science, okay? It's now a religion. And actually, uh, the article by Raymond Littleton called The Non-Existence of the Oort Cloud, of the Oort Cometary Shell, in Astrophysics and Space Science Magazine, Volume 31, December 1974, uh, page 385 to 401. He said there is no Oort Cloud. There certainly is no observational evidence for it. So here's, Matt's, here's basically the argument. Comets are flying around through space. They're burning up. Right. They only last 10,000 years. The question is, why do we still have them? The evolutionist answer is, there's a mystical place out there where new ones are coming in to replenish the supply. Which still, obviously, does not answer the question of where did they come from to, to fill the cloud. No, it doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who filled the cloud? Eventually, the cloud's going to run out of material. Who's sending them here? And who's sending them here? Right. Uh, they'll say, well, a star passes by and, you know, perturbs the gravitational perturbance, you know, and, uh, bumps them and nudges them. Come on, guys, get down there and burn up in the earth. Yeah, I don't want to go this time. It's Georgia's turn. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go burn up. Um, so the young Earth argument of the Oort cloud is still very legitimate. He's got a long answer about all this stuff. Walt Brown's book in the beginning, by the way, page 33, as well as a bunch of other pages. He talks about the, the uh, comets and uh, quite a few references here. But page 33 is where it does say, um, where he references that they cannot be more than 10,000 years old. Okay. Uh, great one. For more information, he refers to another book, 
The Origin of Comets, page 188 through 276. That's what I like about Dr. Brown's work. It's so thoroughly documented, yeah. you know, but just from a logical perspective, the whole idea of comets burning up, Dave, is the opposite of evolution. You've got to have an answer for how something forms. All we see is stars are blowing up, sun is burning out, comets are burning up. Uh, where's the formation of things? Where's this, everything is winding down, it's not getting better. Um, so, the idea that things can get better is simply fairy tale stuff. If you want to believe that, you just go ahead and believe it. Okay, young earth proof number four, there are no fossil meteorites in the geologic column. Uh, it's been years since I used that one. I don't recall uh, where, I think it still, may still be in our seminar notebook. As far as fossil meteorites, a lot of meteorites have been found. If the layers of the earth are different ages, it's logical that meteors would hit and then get covered up by more sediment. Right. The fact is there are very few, if any, meteorites found in, buried in the geologic column. Uh, so the question would be, why not? You know, there ought to be millions of them. By his thinking, the earth is billions of years old. Each layer sat there for millions of years waiting for the next one, which, of course, brings up the obvious question, where's this material coming from? You know, you keep adding to the earth to get this mile-thick geologic column. Where's all this dirt coming from? It has to come from somewhere. Mm. He talks about, he gives a, a whole list of places where he says meteors have been, or craters have been found in different rock layers. Is that what I'm reading right? Yeah. Yeah. Location of craters. So many million years ago, how many millions of years ago they were. And you'll notice it just happens to go right along with the, uh, the geologic column. And th if there's a meteor in that layer, then that proves that it's the soul, is what he's saying. Okay. Now let's take just one. I'm just going to pick one out of the clear blue sky. I've not seen your list before, Dave. Here's one that says it's 300 million years old, found in uh, Serpent Mound, Ohio, from the Carboniferous era. How do you know the Carboniferous era is 300 million years old? How do they know? I, I know how they think they know. <laughs> how do they think they know how the old the layer is? Probably based on what they find in it. Because coal is found in it. Mm. They've already got this theory that coal formed 200 million years ago, 250 or 300 million years ago. Therefore, the layers are dated by the fossils, and the fossils are dated by the layers. This so is if you find reason. coal, the coal is 250 million years old because right. it's covered in it. Right. So therefore, is. since there's a hole in the coal, there must be... 300 million year old meteor strike. Therefore, that proves there are fossil meteorites. Real stretch there, Dave. Okay, we've got to take a break in about 20 seconds. And we'll come back and take a few more of the Young Earth proofs. But if you want to get on our website, drdino.com, and get our video series, Creation Science uh, Series, on uh, drdino.com, you can still get it in time for Christmas if you'd call quick. Today's date is whatever it is, December 15th or 16th or something in there. I just got off an airplane. I'm a little uh, behind schedule. But if you can get on our website, go order our materials. Great Christmas present for a friend. Get somebody saved. So go to drdino.com and uh, take a look at our stuff. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us, Dr. Dino Live, and we'll get to your questions as quick as we can. Thank you. All right, folks, welcome back to the final segment of Creation Science Hour. This is Kent Hoven in Pensacola, Florida, and my son, Eric. Hello. And we're dealing with some of the uh, anti hoven websites, uh, since you've got to carry on the Hoven name here, son. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Um, Basically, we believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. We think the evolution theory is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of the world. And if you would think you came from a rock, well, you can just go ahead and enjoy yourself. But it's not true. We're answering some of the Antihoven websites. This could go for years, okay? We're not going to answer them all, believe me. We're just going to do a few more here and then drop it. So if any of the things on the Internet bother you, if you give us a chance to defend me, uh, give, my, give me a chance to defend myself, I'll call in. I'll be glad to talk with you. You can call 850 479 Dino, 850-479-3466, or you can AOL Instant Message us, and we'll do, do it right on the radio program, 5 to 6 Central Time, every day on truthradio.com, every weekday. We're now talking about talkorigins.org, uh, slash FAQS, frequently asked questions, slash Hovind, that's me, slash how good dash yay, uh, from Dave Madsen. And I'm just going to do a couple more of Dave's arguments here, because his gripe was I haven't uh, answered him in all these years his website's been up. Well, first place, uh, I don't think many people care, Dave, or even know about your website, so I'm probably giving you more publicity now than you've ever gotten. But uh, the fact is, it doesn't matter uh, what you think in, in, in a broad sense. What does God say is all that matters. And God says he made the earth in six days about 6,000 years ago. And his opinion means a lot more to me than you or anybody else out there. So there is, uh, Jonathan says there's a long uh, dissertation on trueorigins.org answering the talkorigins.org website. So those guys can argue back and forth. I don't go visit any of the sites. This is the first time I've seen some of this material. Um, 
I, have, I speak 800 times a year. I just got off the plane. I leave at 4.30 tomorrow morning to fly to Naples, Florida. I've had 212 flights this year. I just I don't have time. <laughs> I simply don't have time. I got a granddaughter I'd rather go see, right? Yeah. Hey, see her. Okay. Okay. And one more coming. When? Yeah, May 2nd's the due date. And Angelina Marie, we believe, is the name. Let's we'll see what happens with that. It's too long of a name. You've got to get a shorter one. Okay. They're going to well, call her Angie. You know that, right? Angel. Angel? Angel. Always up in there harping about something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah You've got to watch that name. Okay. Okay. Here's uh, Dave Madsen's Young Earth Proof number five. The moon is receding a few inches a year. Less than a million years ago, the moon would have been so close that tides would have drowned everyone twice a day. Less than two or three million years ago, the moon would have been inside Roche's limit and thus destroyed. Okay, Dave, you have a legitimate point here. I was wrong to set those numbers. The numbers are not correct, okay? I, I accept your criticism. I, I've changed that years ago. Uh, this was 1992, debate I did with uh, Dr. Hiltman. It's one of those debate situations where things are flying real fast and you... Uh, I, I should not have given those numbers. The concept, though, is correct. The moon is receding. We are losing the moon. That means it used to be closer. Yeah. If you bring the moon in closer, eventually you create a problem. Walt Brown's done all the math on this, and he's a uh, Air Force, retired colonel from the Air Force, Ph.D. in physics, taught physics at the Air Force Academy. He puts a limit on it as well. He says 1.2 billion years. 1.2 billion. <clears throat> now, I don't know what the number is, but again, I, no matter what number you throw out, they're going to miss the point. Yeah. The moon is getting farther away from the Earth. What does that mean? It used to be closer. Closer. <laughs> If that's moon, what we at Dinosaur Adventureland call a bad, a bad thing. thing. Right. If the moon were, is that right, Dan? Well, almost. almost. Uh, what do you call it? It's a bad thing. Oh, around here we like to refer to that. We like to refer to as a bad thing. Okay, thank Normally you, Normally we can only drown once a day. In yeah. A couple billion years so, that wouldn't have been good. Uh, Dave, you're right for my 12-year-old uh, quote here that I said uh, a, billion, a million years ago it would have been a problem. You're right. That's not correct. It would not have been a million years ago. However, you're missing the point. Yeah. It would have been a problem. Now, if we go back in time far enough, the moon actually, literally, would have been skimming the surface of the Earth, wouldn't it? Well, way before that, it would break up. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. But if it did get that close, that would explain what happened to the dinosaurs, right? The tall ones. The tall ones. What yeah. happened to them? They got mooned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that one. Okay. So I think this is an example of how they strain a gnat and swallow a camel. They, they pick on a figure and totally miss the point. Um, and he goes on to talking about the recession rate of the moon, and how do we know this recession rate has been consistent? Oh, no, Dave, that's an excellent point. I'm sure that we don't know. I think there are physical science things that would, would tell us, you know, how it would behave just by gravitational attraction, which Walt Brown goes through in his book there. However, you do the, very, you do the opposite, though. You want your cake and eat it, too. You're saying we can't extrapolate, you know, the moon is leaving, so we can't extrapolate this back in time. But yet you do want to extrapolate back in time for carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating. You do the very same thing. So, um, you know, we have to be a little consistent here. The debate with Hilpman in 1992, uh, 14 years ago, was indeed, uh, I, I should not have said that. And I've never said it, I haven't said it for probably 12 years, okay, since then. It, it does put a time limit, though. And I appreciate it. Iron sharpeneth iron, and critics can be a good friend. And I've appreciated good criticism over the years, and I've corrected things in my seminar. I corrected this one a long time ago. My suggestion is, since I'm no longer using it, you take this off your website. Or you update your website with a more modern quote when I say, the Earth-Moon system cannot be billions of years old. Refute that one, please, Dave. I'd like to see that. Okay. Young Earth proof number six. The moon contains considerable quantities of U-236 and TH. What's that stand for? Thorium. Okay. 230. Glad that knows. You know, that's something I learned very quickly in life is that daddy knows everything. That's right. Anyway, he goes on to say, uh, both of which are short-lived isotopes that would have expired long ago if the moon were four and a half billion years old. Okay, this is only something mentioned in my seminar notebook. This is not something used in my seminar. This is a quote that I got, and I think I referenced uh, Walt Brown's book and a couple of other uh, creation scientists that have used this quote. Um, and he goes through, you know, uranium slowly decays to lead. As it decays, it goes through numerous stages, one of which is thorium. And... They're, these are short-lived isotopes. Uh, there should not be any left. You can read uh, the argument in our seminar notebook for yourself. We're going to run out of time here with our 12 minutes. Let's just take a couple more quick ones here, and we'll have to call it a day for that one. I get to go be Grandpa. Is that right? Is she coming over? Uh, yes, she is. Amen. Okay. That's a deal. Now, let's see. Young Earth proof number seven. Space dust would be vacuumed out of the solar system with the Pointing-Robertson effect. 
is a, in a few thousand years. Since that's not the case, the Earth is very young. This, again, is from, uh, I could look in my seminar notebook. It's not something I use every day in my seminar, so I don't recall where I got this from. Um, the, the concept, though, is what I want you to try to get. The dust in space would gradually be vacuumed in or hit by planets. It would be absorbed by the gravitational pulls of planets or moons as they go around. There are nine planets and nearly 100 moons now that have been discovered. Or the pointing Robertson effect would drive them out. What we were talking about earlier, small diameter stuff would be pushed out. This is from, uh, um, I believe, Walt Brown's book uh, where he talks about the pointing Robertson effect. So I'd have to defer you to Walt Brown to defend that. It's just, I was simply repeating his argument, which to me sounded very valid when I read through the whole thing. Uh, young Earth proof number eight. At the rate star cl many star clusters are expanding, they could not have been traveling for more than a few thousand years. Dave, I'll have to say you're probably right that I should not use the few thousand years, and I haven't used that in, in 10 years probably. Um, it does put a time limit, though. The fact is star clusters are expanding. Now, when it comes to star formation, the evolutionists have a real serious problem. We don't have a clue how one star could form. All we see are stars are blowing up, stars are burning out, uh, the universe is winding down. We see a star blow up about every... 25 to 30 years. Only less than 300 supernova rings have been discovered so far. So <clears throat> the question would be, this would indicate only eight or 10,000 years worth of, you know, six to 10,000 years worth of uh, formation for supernovas. Why aren't there more? Would be the obvious question I would ask. Yeah, we should see lots of them. Yeah, what do you cover in your seminar on that one? I just talk about the fact that they, we never have seen a star form. I've had several people come to me in meetings, evolutionists saying, and bringing me pictures. You know, look what the, whole, uh, uh, the Hubble telescope has done. This right here is a picture of a star forming. Now, what are you doing? <laughs> Can a picture show a star forming? No. It would show either a star or a bright spot. It would show something, but it can't show it form, can it? No. A video <clears throat> can show a star yeah. form. So if you see a spot getting brighter, suppose you take a series of pictures night after night, and you notice a spot is getting brighter. Mm. What does that prove? That proves that the spot is getting brighter. That's exactly correct. It doesn't prove a star is forming. There could be uh, dust is clearing, and there's a star behind it. Uh, plus, there are Boyle's gas laws <clears throat> which prevent this from happening. Here's a, Martin Harwit wrote an article in Science Magazine, volume 231, uh, March 7th of 1986, on page 1201. He says, The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of those stars managed to form. 